well, yes, we have all known about this for years, and we've all kept quiet because we were all frightened. We were frightened that we would lose the funding we've currently got. We were frightened that we would be picked on. Well, it's, it's enough now. That was Chair of the Haute Valley Board of Governors, Philip Leclerc, and I'm News Editor of Express, Fiona Potney. Putting Children First. This week, the Governors of Haute Valley School handed back a poster that appeared on their walls with that very government message on it. The move was at the request of a Year 11 girl who said that, quite plainly, it was a lie. Now, handing back a poster might not sound like a revolutionary act, but it represented a lot. A school already cut to the bone being forced £600,000 over budget simply to keep teaching with the lights and heating on. It represented government support for a £70,000 programme to divert young offenders from a dismal future, disappearing without explanation. It represented ministers failing to answer school governors' messages of concern for months. And most damningly, it represented a finding that all non-fee-paying schools across the island are underfunded to the tune of £23 News, apparently, met with a shrug by the Education Minister. When Philip Leclerc and former Haute Valley Board of Governors Chair Phil Hawley revealed details of what they described as a funding crisis at a scrutiny hearing this week, the government clapped back in an urgent statement. It said that the State's Assembly had voted for a 35 million range of services over the years to support the island's children and families. It said that education was due to get 11.6 million recurrent funding by 2024, that more money would be put towards children with special educational needs, and that £400,000 had been set aside for an intensive support service to help children getting involved with the criminal justice system. Crucially, the government said it was committed to putting children first and that it would continue speaking with all schools about how best to do that. To understand Hope Valley's concerns in further depth and to analyse the government's response to them, I invited Philip Leclerc to the Bailiwick Pod studio this week and started by asking him about the role of a school governor. Our function is to ensure that the school follows the policies and procedures of the department, especially financial, and that we ensure that the school doesn't overspend and that a budget is set in place. Um, we've got some other duties, but the law is quite clear about you know what we have to do. We have to make sure that the school follows the policies and we have to make sure that they don't overspend. Paint us a picture of the demographic you're looking after with Haute Valley. What's the student population like? How big is it? And, and what type of facilities are they accommodated in? So it's a school for 600, um, mixed ability, uh, it, 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 really broad, really, really broad. So if you name a a type of human being, we'll have some of those at Hope Valley. So it's 600 people, mostly town dwellers, mostly have come from the the primary schools in town in catchment, some from outside. Uh, Wonderful bunch of people, wonderful bunch of children. I shouldn't really call them children, I suppose. They'll tell me off for that. Uh, And and a really dedicated staff team uh, who provide all sorts of support and an incredibly balanced and broad uh, curriculum. We're really proud of the fact that we have exactly the same curriculum as Holier, the, the grammar school with the exception of mandarin we don't we don't teach mandarin but we have every other subject that that holia does which is a, a great achievement i think and down to stuart hughes who is the a, a simply outstanding head teacher tell us a little bit about what type of funding that requires um to look after that population this is where all the, the last few days have really sort of blown up is because we've been looking at a funding deficit for quite some time now and as a board of governors we had to, to make a really tough decision and faced with a, a £600,000 overspend because there wasn't enough money, we had to make the decision to either support basically the, the bonkers budget that, that school was being given or ask the head teacher to follow a, a full balanced curriculum. And we chose the curriculum over, over the funding. And we shouldn't have to have, had, have to have done that. Funding for schools has been under question for a long, long time, for many years. I was a, I was a parent governor in 2004 at Hope Valley, so I've got a long connection with the school. And we were having conversations back then with Bob Fairhurst, the head teacher, about the significant shortfalls in funding and the difficulties in balancing the books. In 2004, we were working on a funding model that was designed in 1992. So it was quite out of date by then. Unbelievably, we're still using the same funding model. 1992 funding model to, to, to fund the education of children in 2021. Nearly 30 years old. Yeah. Now, they did do a review of it. In 2020, the education department, and they identified that there was nearly 12 million quid adrift, 
and so they agreed that they were going to put two million quid back, uh, twelve million quid, almost or eleven point seven, I think it was, back into the system by two thousand and twenty-four. Hardly swift, but at least it was money that was going to go back in. In the meantime, the government asked the department, sorry, the education department asked a group of head teachers and some external professionals to look at the funding model because we'd all been saying this funding model doesn't work. It's, it's no longer fit. You know, you think think of a classroom in 1992. There would have been no computers. There would have been no electronics. There would have been no interactive whiteboards. It was a different world, and we're, we're, we're funding it based on that different world. So this group of professionals, educationalists, looked at the funding model, designed a new one, took them quite a long time. I think it was about a year they, they took to put together this new model, and they published this new model. And based on the new model compared to the old model, there is, on top of the 11.7 that the government had identified in 2020, there is another £23 million pounds adrift. Now, that's just to provide a base education. That's not whistles and bells and finery and frippery and, and fluffy things. That is just the core education that every child in Jersey should expect to get and is entitled to get, because the law quite clearly says that a child is entitled to an education. So does the Human Rights Act. There's all sorts of legislation that says we have to educate children, and that's right. So when we heard about this £23 million pounds deficit, deficit, and we were told that by Sean O'Regan from the Education Department that it was £23 million, we went to the Education Minister. We're quite happy, actually, that finally, after all of this, these years of fighting, there was an acknowledgement that we were grossly underfunded to the tune of £23 million. Pounds. We asked the Education Minister how we were going to get it, and he said, well, you're not. And he used the words, the pot is the pot. That's what he said. That was his exact phrase. The pot is the pot. And everybody at the meeting stood around, kind of not sure what to say. And they said, well, but it's identified the money. And his response to that was, well, what do you want to do? Stop digging the roads. Which is, is gobsmacking. It's a gobsmacking statement to make. I'm using that term a lot, I'm afraid, but it, it's, <laughs> it is. So as a board of governors, we went to the head teacher and we said, enough. We're, we're taking this away from you now. We're taking this out of your hands. We're not going to... You're not involved in this next bit. We're going to go and we're going to try and resolve this. Now, having taken four months to get the education minister to school, four months of, of requests for a meeting, after finally getting there, we, we thought, well, it's a waste of time now. The pot is the pot. Stop digging roads. Whatever. We went to scrutiny and we gave our evidence to scrutiny on, on Monday of this week. And to be honest, we weren't expecting the explosion in the media. But in hindsight, perhaps we should have because this is an emotive subject. And I've been literally overwhelmed by messages of support and people saying, we've known about this for years. So there is this, this massive hole in the funding. And why do you think it's taken so long for this to finally come out and yourself or, or for anyone else to speak up about it? I, I don't know is the answer. All I, and, and I worry. There's another review that's happened. There's this, uh, an inclusion review. And we were told that that had been completed some time ago, but that's gone quiet as well. And you have to ask the question, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this is definitely the case, but I, I, as a man in the street, I have to ask the question, is it not coming out because it's unpalatable? Is it because there's stuff in there that the government doesn't want us to know about and doesn't want to admit? And what would that inclusion review cover? Everything to do with ensuring that children with additional or special needs have the same full and balanced curriculum as everybody else, and they have the right to inclusion. And that is a right. Again, you know, this isn't about us trying to be fluffy or politically correct. This is about children's rights. You know, they are entitled to this. And we've got a government that has made great play about putting children first. Every document that comes out of a government office, every poster, every presentation, has the words putting children first that's what they say so you cannot then uh, behave the way that they are and hold on to that 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 motto it's just it doesn't make any sense so we know that this that the inclusion review is done but we don't know what that means but the 23 million pounds that we know has been identified by the department and it wasn't a number that we made up that's going to be on top of that and that's on top of the 11.7 that's already been been agreed so what you're saying is there's more than 30 million that schools are owed, essentially. There's a, a difference of 30 million between what the schools need to produce a, to provide a proper curriculum and what they're currently receiving. So our children are being deprived because schools are not able to function 
in the way that they should be. We know that um, obviously, that as you say, the government did have this pledge to put children first, but that sort of coincided with a massive drive to make efficiencies and, and savings, as they called them, rather than cuts. And they were very keen to point out that this was all about every department, including the education department, trying to deliver the same services um, for less money or even perhaps even better services than before. We know that um, at Hope Valley, you, you've had some amazing achievements. Um, the percentage of students achieving five a star to C a GCSE grades rose from 23% in 2018 to 64% this year. So does that not suggest that you can continue on this shoestring budget and still get great results? Yeah, but for how long? I run a business and if I saw my staff being worked to the level that the staff at Hope Valley and other schools are being worked, if I saw the way that budgets are having to be robbed from one to pay another, if I foresaw, you know, a, a, the school was overspent by £600,000 last year, in spite of all of the penny pinching and, and savings. We, we asked the head teacher to do a, a calculation with the funding he receives to, to take out the, the wages and take out the utility bills and the things that he had to pay, so the gas bill for the heating and the, and the lights. And we asked him how much, much was left to spend on, on books and pencils. And there is nothing. There is nothing. So the £600,000 overspend was the things that were spent on the books and the things that we, we needed. We've got a school that has currently 600 students in it got a canteen that seats 160 so we have to say to all of those other boys and girls at lunchtime sorry canteen's full go and find a corner in the playground somewhere and it doesn't matter what the weather is there is nowhere else for them to sit we've got a retaining wall that's dangerous and falling down and the department's uh, response to that is to put a fence around it a temporary fence we are not putting children first and i, I know that there's, there's we've gone through a pandemic and there have been financial strains and burdens on uh, on government uh, and they've had a very difficult time. They have, absolutely. But that doesn't take away from the fact that education is a core part of your business. I spend my working life looking at my budget, looking at my balance sheets, and thinking where I spend the money for my company. And there are some lines on my budget that are absolute core, and I must do. If I don't do them, my business doesn't function. And if we think of Jersey as a business, which in some respects we should, Education is a core line of funding and must be spent. We, we cannot fudge around that and cut back on that because that's just a false economy. It, sooner or later, it will be like my business deciding not to buy any lorries, not doing any deliveries. Very, very quickly, my business would fall apart and close. If we don't look after education, we've got, no, we've got nobody for the future. But th these young people, the children and young adults at Hope Valley and all the other s secondary schools, are the future of Jersey. And if we don't invest in them properly now... We are just shooting ourselves in the foot long term. I wonder if we can just pause there and talk about one specific part of the student population, the, the more vulnerable children, those that might have either disadvantaged backgrounds or difficult home lives for any reason. How will they lose out as a result of this or how are they currently losing out? What, what, what's the impact of all these budget struggles on them? Well, one particular area that's a concern is students with English as an additional language. Students have, have come to Jersey with their parents. Um, not always, but often it's to be to work in poorly paid manual jobs or, or in hospitality, so that their, their backgrounds aren't affluent. You know that they, they they pay their taxes and they pay their way, uh, and they're, they're wonderful people. Uh, you know they've come for a better life with their children. Currently, the school is being offered an opportunity to bid, so not being given, but an opportunity to bid for up to nine hundred and fifty pounds to support the students with English as an additional language at Hope Valley. Per student, or no, 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 for the year for the for the whole school. Uh, which equates to a couple of quid per student, basically. Uh, an, an Oxford School Dictionary from Amazon is £6.55. So we can't afford to buy each student with English as an additional language a, a, a dictionary. That's not funding appropriately. We, we've got some great examples of students who've come to Jersey with little or no English and who are running businesses. I, was, I had a meeting with somebody at a, a, um, a marketing company the other day, an ex-Hope Valley student, who is now the managing director. But when he came to Jersey, he spoke no English. And he, and he referenced it was the, the teachers at Rouge Bonnier and Hope Valley that taught him to speak English and helped him to get on. And he's a, a resounding, marvellous success and a great example of what, what can happen if you put the right kind of resources in. It, it, if we're going to fund a school to the point where they can't even buy a dictionary for a child, then what is what hope is there? And just to put this into context, it's around 40% or 50% of the student population at Hope Valley that's it, it, yeah, English as an additional language? It is. A, yes, it is, yeah. Um, and that, you know, it's difficult. It's really difficult. 
And I've got to say that these kind of interviews, I, I'm finding very uncomfortable. I'll, I'll be honest. And I'm very cross with the government that, that they've made me do this. You know, we tried to engage with the chief minister when he was the education minister on the 17th of May. He still hasn't responded to any of those emails. Uh, we then contacted um, Scott Wickenden on the 19th of May because he was given that portfolio. And we didn't get a meeting until the 22nd of September. As a, as a governor, I should be standing up telling everyone how proud I am of the school. And I am incredibly proud. You know, 23% to 64%, I think is the number. I can't remember off the top of my head. GC, five A star to C GCSEs is unbelievable added value. It really is. But it's at what cost and how sustainable. And frankly, it's not. So when I have to go on and talk about the shortcomings of the school and the failings of the school, that really feels, I, I feel very disloyal. I feel like I'm almost betraying the students that we're there to, to support. I'm getting a bit emotional, sorry, I, but I, it's, it's not fair. It's not right that we should be sing, singling out these students and saying they cost more because they've got this or they cost more because they've got that. We have a fully inclusive school. We have children with ADHD, children with autistic spectrum disorders, um, people with, with mental health issue, issues, social and emotional behavioural difficulties. We just have, it is just a school. It's a melting pot of, of all of the wonderfulness that makes Jersey such a wonderful place. It is every type and size of human being. So having to identify particular individuals is, is, is very disloyal. But if we keep coming back to the, the fundamental problem is, we've got a model that the department has now been given that says £23 million needs to be put into secondary schools. And this isn't higher education this is not highlands this is not the inclusion review this is not special needs this is just the main body of students it's 23 million pounds adrift and if you're going to come out with crass statements like what do you want me to do stop digging the roads then i'm sorry you're not putting children first um and I'm, i really would like the other governors and in fact the public of jersey you know i've had lots of messages uh, messages of support i think it's time we all started rattling a few cages we started saying that the, enough is enough Interestingly, on Monday, I expected the phone to ring off the hook from the department. I expected to be contacted with requests for meetings, with perhaps a call from the minister himself. We haven't heard. We haven't heard anything from him. And interestingly, in yesterday's urgent statement from the government, the last paragraph says, the Chief Minister and Minister for Children and Education will continue their dialogue with Hope Valley. I don't know how you can continue a dialogue that hasn't actually started because... John Lafondre has never returned any of my emails or calls. So that's not, it's not continuing a dialogue. And have you ever been given any reason as to why you haven't had any feedback to your messages? Very busy. They're very busy. That's, that's it? Yeah. Yeah. And his private secretary would say, we're, trying to, we're speaking to the minister and trying to sort out a meeting. I had an, I had an email in July from the minister's uh, personal secretary that said, we're, we're looking at the diary and we should have a meeting this week or next. That was in July. The meeting took place in September. I'm really sorry, but that's not a continuing dialogue. Do you think there ought to be maybe some kind of statutory relationship between governors and ministers, for example, or, or some kind of formal set of rules or a, a code that should be followed to ensure that you continue that engagement? Because obviously this is a really pressing issue and you've been trying to push it since May. Yeah, but th and that's, the, that's the really bizarre thing is because if you look at the law, the Board of Governors is there to, to support the department. So the minister, we are the, we are there for the minister. It, it, so it it, just, it beggars belief that it's it's stayed silent. I mean, the, the the statement that came from the government yesterday. Firstly, I mean, it was it was faceless and nameless, so we don't even know who to speak to about it. And, and it was full of nice fluffy platitudes, but no real substance. It talked about uh, you know I was reading it in, in online yesterday that the, the state's assembly had voted an additional thirty five million per year for the range of services. That's not we're not talking about that. We're talking about education. So that doesn't answer our question. It talked about £11.6 million additional recurrent funding by 2024. But that was the stuff that, were, that came out of the, the funding review in 2019 that was voted for in the state, states in 2020, before, that was before the, the funding model was looked at, before the £23 million was identified. So it's £23 million plus 11.6, not just 11.6. We then, we got in the, the, the release yesterday, talk about... £678,000 in 2022, rising to £2.1 million in 2025. Well, that's based on the demographics. That's not news. We've always known that these students were coming through because of the spike in population. And the, the minute a child is born, we know how much it's going to cost to educate them. So based that was on already the in your plans? So yeah. that, that was already in. Of course, that was already budgeted for because the, the funding model at present is based per head uh, uh, on the student role. 
So based on the numbers coming through the system, that was always going to be the number. So that's not new money. That's just money that we knew that the budget that the government had to budget for because that's what the, the numbers. There is there is one piece in the in the um, statement from government yesterday when they talk about the four hundred thousand pounds for an intensive youth support service, which is really encouraging. But again, I, I'm I'm quite cross about that in some ways because as a school, uh, we tried to tackle that back into last year, beginning of this year. Our head teacher looked at a scheme in, in in Glasgow, I think it was, that was supporting young people who had perhaps gone off the off the rails. We identified a group of children. A very small number of them were, f- were from Hope Valley. The, the major minority of them for, from Hope Valley. They were from other schools, but they were they were having some real challenging behaviours. And they were around having a bar bathing pool. They broke into off the rails cafe, and so on. So uh, as a, as a school, the head teacher Stuart Hughes came up with a, a plan to support those students and re-engage with them. And, and we know that when when young people feel disaffected and disconnected from society. They, they they become the thing you want them to be. It's a self fulfilling pro- prophecy. So, treat them like an outcast. They'll behave like an outcast. But Stuart Hughes came up with this scheme. It was going to cost one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. It was to deal with all of those students who were currently uh, exhibiting those, those really challenging behaviours. Not just Hope Valley. No, 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 no. no. This was an island based thing, and we were told there wasn't enough money. So he rejigged the budget. We got it down to seventy thousand pounds. And my predecessor, Phil Horsley, went to see uh, Mark Rogers, the director of education or director of SIPES, the children and young people's um, thing, and was given a categoric undertaking that it would be supported and we would get the money. And that just died as well. That didn't happen. We didn't what, get the what money. What do you mean by that? Just Were you told what, no, what had gone wrong? No, it just, it just didn't happen. We just got told, sorry, no, you're not having it. There's no money. We can't, you can't have the money. And when we tried to engage, again, we were ignored um, and phone calls went unanswered. You know, Return messages went unanswered. To get us to this point has taken a long, long time. And I don't want people the general public to think that we've just got angry because there was a an email that, that rattled us the wrong way this is a long long period of time of being ignored and treated um with disdain i think is the word i would use um by a government who seems to think that the the best way to deal with challenging news is to be quiet and actually i don't want that we, we none of us want that we want a government that's going to be accountable it's going to stand up you know if you look back on our previous chief ministers um and love them or loathe them, and I'm sure there are plenty that did both. Frank Walker, Terry Lesueur, Ian Gorst, if we'd have challenged any of those, I believe they would have stood up and responded. But at the moment, we're, we're back to the Chief Minister hopes to continue the dialogue, which has never actually started. What to you then does putting children first mean? You said it seems like very much just a slogan or a throwaway phrase that seems to be applied to everything to do with children or education, whether or not it actually is beneficial. So for you, what, what does that actually mean? What would that look like? What immediate action should they take to prove that they are going to do that? Well, I think there should be an urgent review of the government plan and they need to look at where the spending is, is, is being directed. Um, and rather than you know, throwing £100,000 at a, a, a voting registration system that doesn't work and a million quid on an IT system that we, we've been talking about for years that doesn't work and a, a lovely glass and ivory tower in, in the parade gardens for the, 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 um, the civil servants to sit in. Look at where we need to spend our money and, and actually prioritise it. To, to If you're going to say put children first, then put them first. Make them the first line on the budget. Make them everything you do, you start from their perspective. The, one of the, the catalysts for this all whole thing blowing up, and the reason I gave back the, the poster that said putting children first, was because a young lady, a year 11 student, said to the head teacher, please take that down. Please take that down. Because the government of Jersey do not put children first. That's what she said. So if we're going to listen to the voice of the children, we have to do that. And I hadn't planned to give that poster back. That wasn't a, uh, that wasn't a rehearsed thing that we discussed. <laughs> uh, that happened in the meeting. I, I thought... These guys need this back. I, I don't want this up in our school. Let's stop the rhetoric about putting children first and let's start actually showing us that we're putting children first. The government plan is in draft form. Somebody needs to take an amendment that says, actually, you know, we, we put this in. I know there are huge financial pressures on the government. Of course there are. Is it another £250 million pounds is needed for climate um, change yeah, over the next 10 years? Yeah, that's our headline today. <laughs> yeah, a very good headline as well, I've got to say. Um Yes, we need a climate, but if we've got no children because we haven't looked after them, what's the point of sorting the climate out? Because there'll nobody here to enjoy it. You know, that's a flippant thing to say, but we should be putting the children first. There is huge inequity in our education system, huge. 
A student in, in one of the fee-paying schools gets another approximately £2,000 a year spent on their education than a child at Hope Valley or La Rocchia or Grainville or, um, or La Kenneve. You know, £15,000 during their, their secondary school life. That, that, that is not appropriate. That is not fair. Your future shouldn't be limited by, the, the, by the, the, the ability of your parents to pay a fee to attend a school. The unfairness. We've got, we've got a wonderful music department at Hope Valley run by Charlotte Cooper that produces the, the most incredible stage shows and music, and, and she's, a, she's a fantastic musician as well. She struggles all the time. She's always looking for ways to de de deliver a balanced and full music curriculum. But if you're a student at Victoria College, then you're given a, 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 an orchestral instrument in year seven and free music lessons to get you up to grade one in your first year, just as a matter of course. And who actually needs, who actually needs it more, you know? The, so in a school where we're running at a deficit of £600,000 for, for a year just to get through, just to buy pencils and books, you know, there is no money left because the arts are usually the first thing to, to suffer. And just thinking about this investment now, I mean, I hate to talk about it in very kind of blunt financial terms, but in making an investment in children, what does that mean for the future of the island? Well, we've all been banging on, haven't we, in recent weeks. I've heard some wonderful pieces um, and read some wonderful things about the skill shortage and about the need for a, a skill strategy that looks at it over the next three years. Well, we can solve that because we've got 600 students up at Hope Valley, soon to rise to 750, that can meet all of those skills needs if we provide them with the right kind of education and the right kind of support. If we're going to rely on bringing in experts from the UK and senior managers from the, from the UK and we're not going to have any succession planning, we're never going to work our way out of this, this skills gap. We're, we're always going to be one step behind. We, we, we've got to get up front and we've got to put the funding in place. We've got to prime the, the schools with the appropriate levels of funding to enable them to deliver the education that will get us out of the skills trap. The, the, the skills gap, sorry, and the trap that we're falling into of relying on um, having to get people in to, to fill roles. So you actually think part of this could unlock, you know, perhaps some of the population pressures as well that we're facing? Of course it is. You know, the schools are our future. It's a really glib thing to say that you'll see all the time, but they really are. And if we don't provide schools, because, and, and it was interesting listening to um, Deborah McMillan, the, the children's commissioner, uh, yesterday, talking about how schools were more than schools now. They provide so much more. And they really do. You don't just turn up at nine o'clock, do your lessons and go home at half past three. That's not the way it works anymore. You know, they, they are a social hub. We, we, we have, you know, vulnerable children being supported by the school counsellor. We provide a breakfast club for the children who, who don't get to eat in the morning. Um, we have a, a, a revision club on a Saturday morning that's really, really well attended by students, you know, which is one of the reasons our grades have gone through the, the, the ceiling. Um, they are much, much more. But you cannot just keep relying on the fact that teachers who are working, and I kid you not, 60, 70 hour weeks is, is not that unusual. 50, 60 hour weeks are usually are pretty normal. Saying to them, well, I know you've just done a 60 hour week, but would you come in early and help with the breakfasts? Or would you stay behind and help with the football club? Or would you stay behind and do this? You know, in, if you were in, a, in one of the fee paying schools, those staff are paid for those extracurricular activities within the, the state schools. It's just part of the part of the role, and we are so understaffed and stretched that we we cannot just keep maintaining that those, those levels of support. So, would the twenty three million also help you better support staff and ensure that their kind of well being is looked after and that they don't reach? I know you mentioned yesterday, kind of that they're coming to burnout point. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, what it would what it would mean is if that money was invested, and, and this is again just to reaffirm, there's twenty three million pounds for primary and secondary schools is to provide an appropriate baseline education. It would ensure that there were enough staff and enough teachers and teaching assistants in a school to cover the curriculum, to make sure that it was all delivered well and properly, that the children were all achieving their, their potential, and that teachers, it was sustainable. And you could keep doing it year after year after year. My, my real worry is we've gone from 23 to 64% um, because of the, Stuart Hughes and his team, because of the, the staff at Hope Valley, these particular individuals, if they all burn out and go because we just put too much on them, then that those those figures are unsustainable. If you'd have come to Hope Valley four or five years ago and said to the students, what do you want to do when you leave school? You'd have probably got a, don't know. Where are you going to go? Don't know. What do you want to be when you grow up? Don't know. You wouldn't have got anything because they, they didn't have a connection. And a friend of mine um, who was a clinical psychologist 
said he had never seen a bunch of students who were so disaffected and disconnected with society wow. as some of the young people he'd seen that he saw at Hope Valley. We now say to the students, what do you want to be when you, you grow up? And they're telling him, I want to be a media person. I want to be a journalist. I, I want to be a doctor. I want to, be, I want to work in IT. They have a vision of their future. They, they have goals and aspirations. If we don't support them properly by putting them first, which the government keeps saying, if we don't do that, then what's the point of the, those aspirations? It sounds like it's not just a, an issue about the cash itself. It also, it sounds like maybe some attitudes need to change, a bit of a mindset shift there as well, so that these things are thought about in context, so that it is seen as an investment in the future, getting children the a good quality education that they need, yeah. getting children out of potentially the criminal justice system, for example. Yeah. I mean, as, as I say, you know, that, that scheme that Stuart designed that in the summer that was going to start before the summer holidays, if that had taken one child out of the criminal justice system, if that had stopped one one young person, and we were hearing that there were some individuals who, who were being arrested every day, we, we were hearing those numbers. If we had taken one of those students out of that and broken that, that cycle and got them re-engaged with education and got them back into being part of the school community, that £70,000 becomes a tiny, tiny amount of money. And if we stop one person going to prison for a year, that seventy thousand pounds. I don't know how much it costs to keep somebody in prison for uh, for a year. I've, I once read somewhere that it was over a hundred thousand pounds. So our seventy thousand pounds is nothing. Our twenty three million, in the grand scheme of Jersey, you know, do we really want to go broke for twenty three million pounds? Do you feel you've got enough teeth? I mean, obviously, you, you've put this issue onto the agenda now. You've spoken publicly about it, and that's an important step forward. But. You mentioned in the scrutiny hearing there are perhaps are concerns in other schools as well. Do governors have enough teeth to be able to get the government and kind of shake them and, and, and get the results and outcomes that you need? No, frankly, no, we don't. That, that's the problem. We don't have the same statutory rights that a board of governors would have in the UK. Um, that hasn't been set in the law. Um, but we shouldn't have to. The education minister should be fighting our cause. The education minister should be listening to the schools and should be standing in the States and demanding that his, his um, peers in the states of Jersey stand up for the rights of children because he, he and they all have said they're putting ch children first. We don't have the, 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 the teeth to do it. We can't. We can't reprimand the minister. We can call him out, which is what we're doing now, I think. And we can call out the chief minister, I think, which we're doing now. I've had so many messages over the last two days from all sorts of people, from students who felt that they weren't supported, from t current teachers, uh, from previous politicians, um, from all sorts of people. And every single one of them just says, thank goodness somebody's finally standing up because we've all known about this for years. Well, yes, we have all known about this for years and we've all kept quiet because we were all frightened. We were frightened that we would lose the funding we've currently got. We were frightened that we would be picked on. Well, it's it's enough now. We, we, we've got to stand up. And what's that great saying? For, for evil to succeed, all it needs is for good men and women to do nothing. Well, we're not going to do nothing anymore. We're going to we're going to actually try and get this changed. We need to because when I when I look at the faces of these students and I look at the faces of these teachers who are unbelievably committed, you would you'd have a, a heart of stone not to to want to try and change it. Um, and beside all of that, I'm not trying to create something new. All I'm trying to do is get the government to acknowledge that their own report into the funding model has identified a £23 million shortfall. You know, my, my real worry, this, this, my, my personal experience of this government is when bad news hits it, it buries it, it hides it, it runs away from it. And before we know what happened, there'll be another review will come out which will prove that actually the £23 million was an error and it doesn't really matter and we'll, and we'll, just, we'll just die a death and it will, we'll go away and we'll leave the Board of Governors and somebody else will come along later on and start being angry again because um, we'll run out of steam. Well, I, th I think now's the time to, to just, we need to dig our heels in. And, and as a Board of Governors, we are determined to, to follow this through. And to, I, am, I am really pleased. If, if the Chief Minister and the Minister for Education are now going to engage with us and going to start dialogue, not continue, because they, mm -hmm. they haven't started. If they're going to start dialogue, then that's great. But that's only the first step. Putting their money where their mouths are and delivering the £23 million that will be the measure that we can say yes or no that they achieved what they said they were going to achieve. If they start putting children first, and then I'll be the first one to take my hat off to them and applaud them and thank them. You said you don't feel that the ministers are fighting your corner, but that there's been this great swell of support from the public. How can they fight as well? 
I think by contacting their deputy, contacting their constable, um, making it known that they, they're behind this, uh, and, and, you know, writing to Bailiwick Express, writing to whoever, just get it off your chest. Joy, join in. We've got to get these children what they deserve. Let's just stop talking. Let's just stop the waffling. Let's do the right thing. Philip Leclerc, thank you very much. We'll be continuing to follow the education funding crisis closely and holding the government's feet to the fire on its commitment to put children first. You can find all the latest updates on bailiwickexpress.com. If you think this issue is important, please give this podcast a shout out on Facebook or Twitter or share it with friends and colleagues. In case you're interested, the intro and outro track is called I Shift My Weight by Luno. More next week from me, Fiona Potany, and the Bailiwick Express team.